Hello, thank you for choosing to watch this video. This is number 10 in the series What If Fantasy Model Kit Box Artwork. This time around we are going to look at a bunch of imaginary matchbox kits and jumping right in with Raiders of the Lost Ark. Here in the UK the Star Trek The Motion Picture kits were done by Matchbox and uh, Star Trek was a Paramount movie and Raiders was a Paramount movie around about the same time. I thought, hey, let's do Matchbox kits. Because apart from anything else, I haven't done many Matchbox kits, and they're sort of really fun packaging and, and had great artwork. Roy Huxley was the primary artist for the box art, and he did it really amazing stuff and, and definitely helped Matchbox compete with Airfix at the time, where Airfix had the, the iconic Roy Cross boxes, and, and Matchbox had some really great artwork as well, and really interesting sort of offbeat subjects as well. But anyway, jumping right in with Raiders of the Lost Ark. I think this film probably needs little introduction. It is a fantastic film, <laughs> breathtaking at its pace. The story is super tight. The direction, you know, Harrison Ford, the music. It is just a perfect film. Great fun, great fun. We'll start with the Pan Am flying boat, which is a short Solent. Early in the film, uh, we see Indiana Jones get on board this and fly from San Francisco off, off on his adventure. They had a real plane that they'd found and, and shot for this. I think they added the markings, but the aircraft didn't actually fly. So all the shots of it in the water and flying are um, a visual effect shots, and it's a miniature whenever, whenever it's seen flying. I had to do a bit of research in doing this artwork because I couldn't, I couldn't make out what the serial number was was on the tail. It's seen in one of the famous Indiana Jones map montage scenes and it's hard to get a good look at it but I managed to find this video of these um, hardcore Raiders fans who tracked down the boat and went to visit it and during the video there even though they, they film all around this thing there aren't any shots of the tail fin so I couldn't see the serial number but in one of the parts of this video, they talk to the owner and he has some sort of literature on the plane and its use in Raiders and, and a few other bits and pieces. And in that uh, sort of newspaper article, you can see the serial number. So that's where I got it from. Hopefully that matches what's in the, in the film. It, it looks like it when, when I, when I sort of looked at that number, the, the blobs that I can see on the videos of it match up. Matchbox did really nice kits. They were always nicely boxed, nice, nicely presented. And I think famously were in sort of two or three colours, depending on the size of the kit. If it was a small kit, like a like a fighter plane, it would be two colours. Uh, larger aircraft were three colours. So I put this as a 144 scale kit, which would probably make it about eight inches long or so. Now, this is a one colour aircraft. It's basically a white aircraft. It does have a sort of red band across the wings. So maybe you'd have like a, I don't know, a white sprue and a red sprue for the wings and uh, maybe a black or grey for propellers in the interior, something like that. Later in the film, they get to Tanis, which is a big desert location with a sort of makeshift archaeological dig, a Nazi base. And the Ark is going to be airlifted out on this flying wing, which is something they made up for the film. It's a scene where Indy gets into this big fist fight with a giant guy, a member of the ground crew. Apparently for budgetary reasons, the, the aircraft was designed just to have fixed undercarriage, kind of like a, you know, like a Stuka or some of those things. And I think it actually really adds to the authenticity of it being one of those really kind of out there German planes. It, in some sort of literature I read, I've seen it referred to as the BV-38, blah, 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 very uh, adventurous, shall we say, in their designs. This flying wing which is a design is credited to Norman Reynolds, the production designer, and Ron Cobb, the conceptual artist. And Ron Cobb is one of those names that you come across a lot. So with films of this era, he did a lot of designs for Alien and Back to the Future, you know, just a lot of stuff. Great designer. I've depicted it here sort of as if it was flying into the to the dig site early in the morning, so prior to when we actually see it in Raiders, because we needed to see it in flight, just to sort of make it a little bit different, a little bit more interesting. This would be a 70-second scale kit. It's not huge. The wingspan is pretty big, I think. You know, maybe that'd be about 10 or 11 inches, but it's, it's sort of quite a short fuselage. It'd be great if you got a couple of figures with it, a pilot at the front and a gun turret at the back. And in the movie, while Indy's fighting on the ground, um, Marion Ravenwood sort of gets into the plane in the in the gun turret and start shooting things up. So this would be two color kits, so probably a sort of a green and then maybe like a pale blue for the underside. 
Indy Swartz attempt with the plane and the Nazis put the Ark in this truck and there's this incredible chase sequence involving this truck and jeeps and as Indy tries to wrestle back control of the Ark. Matchbox did a fantastic line of sort of military vehicles, tanks and armoured fighting vehicles in 76 scale and they all came with a diorama base. It was absolutely fantastic for sort of young modellers to sort of take models to the next level. You know, they weren't just building a tank, it was a tank on a snowy field or in a bombed out street or something. Really great stuff. So I definitely wanted to have that be part of this kit. So this would be a kit where you'd get two vehicles, the staff car, which is a Mercedes-Benz 320, and the truck, which is actually something that was made by the production from a General Motors, a GMC CCKW six-wheel truck, which they sort of dressed up and painted up to look the part and actually put a Mercedes-Benz uh, emblem on the front of it as well. It's not, <laughs> it's, it's just something they kind of made again, because it's, it's, it's where it is the Lost Ark. So again, they can be, uh, it's not history, it's Indiana Jones. The figures would be the principal guys you see in the in the film. And I did the illustration on the reverse of the box. Matchbox had boxes with great artwork on the front, and then you flipped them over, and they had a clear panel where you could see the sprues inside. And also on, on the military vehicles, you know, an illustration of what it looked like built up to, to basically show you, like, look, no painting required. And some of them were really successful and, you know, some less successful. But for the most part, in all their range, between the planes and the ships, and the tanks, the tanks came out best. They really looked good. And the diorama here sort of shows a little bit of the dig sites, some of those wooden trestle walkways and stuff they have built over the excavation. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. At the beginning of that film, Indy and his companions flee China in this full tri-motor that unbeknownst to them is actually owned by the guy they're fleeing from so they get into a bit of bother they had a real plane that they used for when it's on the ground and for some of the aerial shots but there's one shot in this film that bugged me for years where you see the plane in the sort of map montage flying over the Great Wall of China and I'd always looked at that shot like uh, maybe the plane's a model maybe not I, f- I discovered the magazine Cinefix which was this great magazine that chronicled like big big movies and the effects and how they were done with excellent behind the scenes pictures and information really good magazine and in that there you know, indeed there, there this shot was it's like oh it is it is a model airplane and the great wall of china is a model <laughs> um shot separately and, and you know blue screen and motion control as was the the technique of the day and it's fantastic it's a really great shot even now you look at it like wow that's really <laughs> impressive so i wanted to really sort of honor that that shot and that creativity with this box stuff. I didn't want to just reproduce it though. So what we have here is we have the full tri-motor of Laoche Air Freight. I used a bit of artistic license in putting the, the that sort of logo on this side as well, although I think it's only on the other side. And then the background it's flying over, you can see Pankot Palace where a lot of the action takes place. And then the sort of like river canyon that's next to that where after we see Indy escape um, and the water comes crashing through out of the mines, it's on that canyon. And I painted in the a rope bridge as well like, like you see at the end of the film I don't know if this is geographically correct the scale's a little bit cheated but I wanted to sort of have that sort of locale depicted and it seemed like it would work with this sort of a angle and I really tried to, to, to make the the cliff and, and that sort of stuff look like what you see in the film which is all matte paintings in the film I think they built a small piece of a set you know of, of the cliff face but it's a load of, of matte paintings to sort of flesh it all out it looks great You'd get the two pilots, Indy, Short Round and Willie, sort of passengers in the back. And again, three-color kit, white, red, again, maybe black or gray for propellers and the wheels and, and what have you. And then we had Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade, which was another you know, epic globe-trotting movie. And about midway through the film, Indy and his dad escaped from Berlin on an airship. And it's a giant airship. They never, they never name it. It looks massive in the film. And it carries underneath it this biplane that, that Indy and, and his dad uh, used to escape. And that was actually a real thing. On US airships, on, on the Akron and the Macon, they had this thing for deploying aircraft. They didn't have it in any of the German ones, but as a, as a technique, as a thing, it, it did exist. So in that slightly twisted reality, Indiana Jones exists in it, it's by it. Matchbox did some some battleships in one seven hundredth scale, and and because this thing is the size of a battleship, I did it in seven hundredth as well. It would still come in at about fourteen inches or so. The multiple color 
plastic may be a challenge given that the thing's basically all grey or all silver, but you could maybe have the fins um, be a different colour and certainly the engines and the control cabin be different colours. Probably not the most challenging or enthralling things to build as a model kit, but they always look really, really nice. Airships just look great. There's a there's a sequence where Indy and his dad escape from the airship on, on this biplane, which is, I think it's a Belgium stamp, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, stamper, uh, SV4. It's got a gun turret on the back, so Indy's flying the plane and his dad's manning sort of the cannons, and they get into this dogfight with these two German fighter planes. This would be a 70-second scale, two-color kit, red wings, white fuselage, or, or vice versa, something like that would, would probably actually work pretty well. It would probably look pretty good. So they get into a dogfight with these two German fighter planes, which are not sort of identified. They, they probably should be Messerschmitt 109s. They're not. They're not even Messerschmitt 108s, which sort of looked kind of a bit like a fighter plane. These things look nothing like fighter planes, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but they're painted up to look like them, and they have the, the camouflage. Apparently, they're actually a, a Pilatus II. They're actually sort of Swiss military trainers. I didn't know that the Swiss even had an Air Force. Um, but anyway, it's, just a, it's a Swiss trainer, which probably explains why it doesn't look too much like an aggressive Nazi fighter plane. So that's a fun sequence. It happens sort of over the desert, and I try to sort of depict that and the ocean setting here. Then sticking with that desert locale, there's a big sequence with a with a tank. Indy's dad has been captured. He's on the tank. Indy has to get on board and, and rescue him. And this tank, it looks like a you know one of those sort of classic World War One tanks. It's based on a British Mark Eight heavy tank, apparently. But it was built by the production specially, and they put a, a gun turret on top of it as well, which didn't really exist. But yeah, another perfect subject for an, a matchbox tank kit. And the, and the base that I put for this, you can see here, sort of represents kind of like a cliff edge. And in, in the movie, they're sort of like trudging towards this cliff. So I sort of tried to incorporate that into the base as a figure of Indy and one of the soldiers on top sort of fighting a really fun 76 scale kit. So sticking with that era, one of the great, action adventure films is The Guns of Navarone, based on a novel by Alistair MacLean. It's a World War II drama, a secret mission to knock out these massive guns on the island of Navarone. Totally fictitious, these guns didn't exist. I don't think Navarone is even a real island, but anyway, it's a great adventure film. And early in the film, they have to sort of sneak onto the island unnoticed, so they disguise themselves as, as local fishermen and in this local Greek fishing boat make their way to the island. There's a massive storm sequence where this is featured but it was just really hard to see the bow and as a piece of artwork to represent the kit that you would get I thought you needed to see it a bit more clearly so I sort of imagined this scene of them prior to that storm sequence approaching the island so you can actually kind of see it here with the guns on the mountain in the distance 70 second scale which was Airfix's scale for the MTB and the e-boat and those sort of mid-size boats and it'd be great if you could get figures that depicted Gregory Peck and David Niven and Anthony Quayle Anthony Quinn, Stanley Baker and James Darren who are all on the boat you know the guns that I've wrote if you haven't seen it check it out Staying with Alistair MacLean, there's a film from 1968, Ice Station Zebra, which is a sort of a Cold War thriller. And a lot of it takes place on the USS Tigerfish, which is, I think, a Guppy II class submarine. And Rock Hudson's in charge. And it's really, really well depicted in the film. It looks totally authentic. You see lots of different rooms on the ship and it looks great. And they had a real submarine at their disposal and they photographed it in glorious Super Panavision for the uh, surface shots. All of the underwater shots, I believe, are done with miniatures, and certainly all the stuff at the ice cap is miniatures. This stuff looks really, really good. But it's it's a nuclear submarine. Submarine kits are not the most um, <laughs> involved. I put it in a Ravel box, because it's American. It's a nuclear submarine. It seems like it should be Ravel. And I tried to make it look like what they sort of probably would have done. I haven't listed a scale, because they kind of didn't really back then too much. But I imagine this would be like about an 18-inch long kit, about the size of some of the others they did around that time. Now, I mentioned the um, excellent miniature work, and there's a film from 1978 called Grey Lady Down, which is starring Charlton Heston and involves a nuclear submarine, the USS Neptune, which gets involved in this collision at sea and sinks, you know, way, way, way down to the bottom of the sea. And the film centers around their sort of uh, attempts to survive and get rescued. And the sub is the same model that had been built for Ice Station Zebra. It doesn't look like they did much to it. They maybe have taken the registration number off of it. So, 
why not have it be exactly the same kit? So this kit would be <laughs> would be that same thing reboxed. The artwork is actually even pretty much the same artwork. I, I sort of added in the rocks and caves, and most significantly the snark mini sub, which is involved in the rescue attempts. And I figure that would be a sort of a separate sprue that would have been thrown in to the kit. It's a really small mini sub, I think, here in this painting. It's bigger than it really is. I mean, I've cheated the perspective a bit. But anyway, I thought it made just for a better sort of composition so you could actually see what was in it. And again, box art is selling what's inside the box. So you've got to be able to see the thing. Another Cold War movie is Firefox, made by Clint Eastwood in 1982. And that film features a scene where Clint, flying the stolen MiG-31, has to refuel. And he has a rendezvous, I think, at the North Pole with Mother One, which is a US nuclear submarine. All the shots under the ice flow, those are shots out of Ice Station Zebra. They just lifted that footage above the ice flow with the conning tower breaking through. And obviously when the Firefox is there, are all shot for the movie. But the underwater footage, as sort of depicted here in this box art, is from Ice Station Zebra. So this started as exactly the same artwork that I did for the Ice Station Zebra kit. I just sort of adjusted it a little bit. In my imaginary world, I was like, wow, they would have got a lot of use out of this kit. Because kit companies did that. They kind of, you know, why wouldn't you? Now, a film that in no way could reuse any footage or props or models from a previous film was the movie Tron. Made in 1982 by Disney, it's a sci-fi adventure set in a virtual imaginary world inside a computer. So everything you see in the film is in the virtual world. There's all these games that the people in the, in the film have to go through. And one of them involves these light cycles with this great chase with Flynn and Tron and the other guy whose name I can never remember. And then three operatives of the master control program who are trying to get at them. And there's this fantastic sequence that's just, which just involves the bikes. But I thought, well, I wanted to do a dogfight double artwork and I thought just a couple of the bikes probably wouldn't be that interesting maybe or would be but I really liked the tanks that are in the film so I thought okay let's do a, a tank and one of the light cycles because they do get into a bit of a skirmish as well so that's what's here it's all virtual it's all pixels but I thought well if the guys were six feet how big would these things be compared to them I put it at 30 second scale they could have maybe done them in clear plastic in some way to represent the CG of them or maybe you get kind of like some neon transfers or or stickers for some of it just to kind of give it that sort of Tron look but I don't know it, just, it was fun painting computer graphics that looked like computer graphics when sort of trying to get that look in sort of 2D artwork this would have been a fun dogfight double and that brings us pretty much to the end of this slice of imaginary model kits number 10 <laughs> I'll continue. With, there's a couple of big ticket things I haven't done yet that I want to do that, that I would have loved as kits grown up Please leave any comments or questions below. As usual, check out my website. Please like and subscribe if you haven't. And thanks very much for watching, and I'll uh, see you soon. Thanks again. Bye-bye.